Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your time zone of choice. And uh, thank you very much for joining Provoke Media for our ninth annual Provoke Global Conference, though only the third under that particular name. Um, we are delighted um, to have you all with us today um, for the first virtual uh, Provoke Global. Um, obviously, this year has been an interesting one um, in terms of our ability to uh, produce event events as we normally would. Um, but we're delighted to be able to move this particular conference online and as a result, open it up to a slightly larger audience. We have about a thousand people registered for the uh, four days of the conference, which is um, a significant increase on the number of people that we normally get at the live event. Um, and so we're hoping that there are plenty of uh, newcomers to Provoke Global um, who will learn um, just what a stimulating, insightful, um, and yes, provocative um, three days this conference can be. Um, we have um, a lot of things um, in common with, uh, with the normal event. Obviously, we are looking for as much social media um, engagement as we possibly can. So um, hashtag provoke global for those of you who are um, active on social media. Um, and um, we hope that you'll find plenty to comment on and tweet about as we go through today's activities. Um, before we really get started, uh, I need to say a quick word of thanks to um, all of our sponsors. Um, we have a significant number of sponsors joining us in the conference today. You will meet most of them over the next three days um, and their support is hugely appreciated. Um, and I just wanna um, spend five minutes before we get started um, talking, oh, now that I have a slide in front of me with the sponsors, let me just quickly give them a shout out by name. So thank you very much to Fleischmann Hillard, to We Communications, to Ketchum and BCW and W2O, to Webber Shandwick, Hill and Alton Strategies, Imre, Zeno Edelman, Ad Factors, M Booth, Profit, Finn, Axicom, Crisp, Davis and Gilbert, Eco, Highwire, Allison and Partners, SPRG, The Network One, GCI Health, Prosper Group, APAC D, and WAC. Uh, thank you very much to, um, for your help, not only in um, financing an event on this scale, uh, but also helping us pull together what I think will be some very stimulating content. Um, obviously, this year has been dominated by the coronavirus and its effect on both business and society. Um, and that will be um, a huge overarching theme, I suspect, of nearly every panel um, over the next few days. But there's been plenty of other activity um, and any one of, of several issues could easily have been the dominant story in a normal year. The Black Lives Matter protests that began in the United States and spread around the world, raising the profile of issues of social justice. Um, the American election, uh, possibly the most bizarre um, and um, uh, tonally disruptive election that I've seen in my lifetime. Um, the continuing and potentially growing uh, backlash against technology companies. Um, all of this has combined to create a very special year for people whose job it is to work at the interface of business and society. And the cross currents from those um, four major issues have had an impact across nearly everything that communicators do. Um, there's been a huge impact on corporate culture, for example, um, where employers have become the most trust trusted source of information for a lot of people when it comes to the COVID-19 crisis. 
um, there's been a huge impact on purpose as companies are forced to reckon with um, the importance of engaging with social justice and racial justice issues um, with um, a level of visibility that perhaps they had not thought about before. Um, issues of diversity and inclusion, which have always been at the forefront of, of um, our industry's agenda, um, have taken on a new urgency um, as it becomes apparent that in order to communicate with the world as it is, we need to reflect the world as it is, um, which means many more people of color, and in America in particular, many more black people um, in our ranks, guiding our strategy, helping us engage with an underserved population. Um, fake news, which has been an issue at um, the last four of these conferences, um, is perhaps um, more troubling and more vital than ever before. Um, technology companies are being forced to balance um, the need for free speech with the need to stop the spread of disinformation and are still, in many cases, flailing as they attempt to do so. And at the same time, we have new channels and new medium of communication sprouting up and complicating our lives. Um, I doubt whether any of us expected to be spending the number of hours on Zoom that we have been forced to spend over the last um, year. And that has clearly created some real challenges um, in terms of replacing face-to-face -face communication. And what this means, it seems to me, is that what we do in public relations is more vital today than it ever has been. It is more difficult to build relationships. It is more difficult to earn trust and credibility than it has ever been. The need for authenticity and honesty, for um, truthfulness, for intellectual honesty, as well as basic honesty has never been greater. And we're going to be exploring that and all of the issues that I raised earlier. Um, in fact, the entire relationship between corporations and the society in which they operate over the next three days. To do that, we have a host of really great speakers. Um, you'll be hearing from representatives of organizations like Airstream, CVS Health, DHL, Foot Locker, Hyatt, John Deere, PayPal, Pfizer, Reuters, Samsung, Travelers, TripAdvisor, Tyson Foods, and the World Health Organization, all of which have been forced to reckon with new realities and new challenges over the past 12 months. And I hope that their experience and what they have to say about the challenges they faced and the way that they've addressed them will resonate with everyone in the audience. Um, we are running a very tight ship here, so I'm not gonna waste any more of your time with my introduction. So what I'd like to do to kick us off is to turn us over to the first panel of Provoke Global this year. It is presented by Fleischmann Hillard, it is moderated by Emily Duban, and she is going to be looking at evolving media models. Emily. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. With the speed of innovation in the media landscape and disruption and external elements that we are all reacting to on a day-to-day -day basis, it is wonderful to welcome a time to come together and pause and reflect on our environment discuss our business, our clients, our colleagues, our audiences. And I wanna thank you for the opportunity to do that. One of the things we're gonna discuss here today and something we spend a lot of time with thinking about at Fleischmann, and I'm sure we all do, is our audiences, those consumers and customers and stakeholders and influencers, the people we build stories for. We dig deep into data and analytics and insights and we pressure test it all to understand the nuances of the audiences, the challenges, the opportunities. What we've discovered is that so many audiences and probably this entire audience today has something very much in common. And that's what we're here to discuss. That's something that we all have in common. We've never had so many options to 
find content that appeals to us. There's never been more platforms, more media sources, digital connections at our fingerprints. And with all of these options, we've entered what I call a choose your own adventure content palooza. And I'd like to see if we have the slide up, which we brought. This is what we call the platformers. And this is the articulation and the illustration of choosing your own adventure. So here we have a representation of a chief innovation officer and the day in the life of her content experience. Um, I'm sure that as we all reflect on how we woke up today and how we sort of enter the day, we can relate here. You wake up, you check your email, there might be a podcast, uh, there might be some exercise happening. Um, and as we go through our day, we're encountering uh, different media, different platforms, different forms of entertainment, and different news sources. And this is what we call platformers. And this is one of the things that we want to unpack today. We want to think about how this is affecting what we do for our clients, how we make content, how we make stories, and how that's impacting our audience and the role of journalists in this, this new environment of what we call choose your own adventure. So what we'd like to do today is in that discussion, find the spaces and the places for inspiration, have a talk about what that means to us and hopefully what it means to you. And uh, with that, I'd like to introduce the panel so we can get started. So the first person I see on my phone is Francesco. Thanks for being here, Francesco. Um, he is the co-founder and CEO of Applied XL and also a former journalist. And most recently in your formal life, I believe, Francesco, you were head of R&D for Wall Street Journal in their press room with a role of really making your colleagues' life easier um, and using computational journalism and data and analytics um, to address our changing world around us. So thank you for being here. We're excited to have you. Um, is Olivia here as well? I can only see Francesco on my screen. Yeah, Olivia is here. I can see her. Great. Hi. Um, Olivia Aran is here. She's head of um, editorial subscription strategy for Insider Inc., also a former journalist. Uh, we're really excited with both Francesco and Olivia to be here um, in both their current roles and as former journalists, because that's something I think we really need to understand in this new landscape. And of course, we have Cameron Batten here. He is one of the clients at Fleischmann. Uh, he's the vice president and head of corporate comm for Samsung Americas. And one of the things we talked about with Cameron in preparation for this was, how is this platformer landscape and this choose your own adventure landscape, how does that impact a global company, a company where 73% of consumers have one of their products in their home. And does that scale help? Does that scale hurt? And how do they find a pathway through? So hi, Cameron, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Emily, good to see you. Um, so first I'm gonna start with you, Cameron. Um, in this age of platformers uh, choosing their own adventure, um, with so many options to opt in and opt out of content, to share, to comment, et cetera, what do you find is most challenging for you? How do you plan from a brand and public policy perspective? Can you talk to us a little bit about the impact that this has on you? Yeah, sure, I'm happy to. And Francesco and Olivia, great to see you uh, on here and looking forward to speaking with you. Um, you know, from a Samsung point of view, we, we have a tremendous story on innovation. Uh, we've been here in the United States for more than 40 years. I lead our corporate reputation team which is uh, obviously um, the North America desk. We are based in Korea. Uh, and so our responsibility is making sure that the Samsung story on innovation plays out in the United States in the right way so that our consumers here understand who we are uh, in totality. And I would, I would say that, you know, all I have to do is look at my, my Galaxy phone and I swipe to the left and we have a feature called Samsung Daily which allows all these platforms to converge and for you to choose your own adventure literally. Uh, in there. So all I have to do is look at my phone to remind me of the landscape that I'm navigating uh, as a corporate brand. And, you know, I think what, what we're focused on as a, a corporate reputation team, we have three components. We have a press room uh, for our, our, our journalists to support them in their storytelling. And my team oversees that. We also have a risk and reputation intelligence team. So they really monitor the landscape and making sure that that lane is clear 
so that an innovation narrative can play out, uh, you know, for our consumers. And then obviously we have an internal and workforce team that, that, that carries through to our leaders and our employees, not just in the United States, but around the world. And I think that is probably the biggest um, a challenge in this choose your own adventure landscape is no, because of our size and because of our scale, no action that we take can escape public perception. And so, and we are just that big. And so we are constantly educating our leaders on the decisions that they make and the actions that they take and how that translates into the public domain. You know, we have a phenomenal story here, you know, not just from a product standpoint, but an economic, um, an economic impact in the United States. We've been here more than 40 years. We've invested, you know, more than 30 billion as a foreign investment uh, in the United States. We've created uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs. And so making sure that we were able to tell that story in totality and, and making sure that it's the right story and that we're choiceful and thoughtful about it um, is really one of our biggest challenges and quite frankly, opportunities. So when we, so when we spoke and we were preparing for the panel, one of the things that you said, which I thought was so fantastic was the, the, the importance and the impact of the speed to truth. And can you talk a little bit about what that means to you and how you find the speed to truth? How do you close that gap in this multi-platform, um, as we keep saying, choose the own adventure uh, experience? Yeah, absolutely. We have a tremendous um, uh, risk team that really looks at the landscape. And if you, if you think about the media, it used to be that you, you give a story to you know um, a wire and it would trickle down and obviously... Um, get a broader halo effect. And what we're seeing and what everyone is seeing is this story can erupt anywhere, um, it can evolve anywhere. And so your intelligence and your radar has to be spot on and you have to be monitoring constantly. We have a tremendous team, you know, we have a very, very talented team. And I think what, what they have done uh, remarkably is build a collective awareness of the landscape that we're working in and we're breathing and we're living. And that is something that then helps our practitioners inside the firm um, embrace the notion of the landscape, embrace the, both the risk and the opportunity, and then navigate and make decisions, especially as they're working with their journalists on telling our story. I mean, obviously, Samsung has many different beats that we work with uh, across our, our broad spectrum of products and services. And so our job is to make sure that everyone understands the landscape. So as they enter in there and tell their story, they're doing it in a way that's gonna resonate the best with their audiences. That's great, thanks, thanks. Um, Olivia, I'd love to turn to you first. Um, um, I'll ask a question and then maybe you can tell us a little bit about your role right now. Um, one of the things we talked about in preparing for this and something that Cameron just hit about um, on is a uh, truth and authentic content, which we know has never been harder to distinguish and has also never been more important. So I'd like to know how um, you manage getting and keeping the attention of readers with real and authentic content um, when we're not just competing against other media sources, but entertainment um, as well, Netflix and social media. So can you tell us a little bit about that from your point of view um, at Business Insider and um, as well as maybe a bit from your point of view as a former journalist? Yeah, so hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about, bit about my role. Um, so I work, I'm the head of um, subscription strategy in the newsroom for Insider Inc. Insider Inc is the parent company of Business Insider, which is the brand that you probably know the most, um, as well as um, Insider, which is um, more lifestyle focused. Um, so my role is new. Um, I was a journalist, as Emily said. Um, I worked at Reuters for a long time. I covered M&A. Um, I covered Wall Street Banks. I came over to Business Insider about two and a half years ago to build out our finance team. Um, at the time, um, I, I mean, as many as, you, as, as many of you probably know, um, Business Insider, in addition to, you know, most other publications um, have been, you know, traditionally traffic focused, uh, focus on eyeballs, focus on clicks. Obviously that's changed in recent years um, as the, the media world has moved away largely from um, you know, ad supported model to other models um, and diversified. Um, and subscriptions is one that um, you know, most other, many other media organizations have, have embraced, including us. Um, so my role is, um, it, it's a new one and I re basically represent um, the newsroom um, on our subscriptions team. So acting as the bridge between edit 
um, and um, and product and data and our you know our revenue team and marketing um, and, and, and you know the many different projects that we do um, and I'm always thinking about ways to um, to get new subscribers as well as to engage our current ones um, and to retain um, you know engage and retain our current subscribers. Um, so that's just a little bit about um, my role. Um, and I think that plays really well into um, Emily's question, um, which is how do you distinguish your content and make it stand out when there's so much else out there? Um, so I think it comes down to a couple things. Obviously producing content, um, you know, great journalism, I would say great journalism always wins um, when it comes to you know, getting new subscribers and, and keeping them, um, not just commodity news, giving people you know, depth, um, analysis, sorts that they can't get anywhere else. Um, but it's also a few other things. It's not just great journalism. It's making sure that you're delivering it, it to your readers in a way that's a easily consumable and digestible to them um, and making sure that um, the right people are actually finding and consuming your content. Um, and that really comes down to personal, personalization and curation, um, which is obviously uh, the Netflix model and is why Netflix has become um, so successful. Um, so I'll just talk about a first, um, digestible, consumable. So that's making sure that your stories, um, aren't just, I mean, I came from a wire, but wire copy is really boring. Um, typically, um, I call it like taking your medicine. Like, you know, that you have to take your medicine. It's good for you. Um, uh, but you'd much, much rather, you know, have your stories written in a way, um, in a, in a way that's more designed for you, um, in the way that you'd like to read them, which is likely more conversational. Maybe it has bullets. Um, that's something that, you know, that we've done, um, so, and you're likely consuming news on your screen. Um, so it's really written in a way that optimizes that. Um, and those are all, I think, really points of, of differenti differentiation in a sea of content. Um, something that we like to do as well at Business Insider is the idea of a flexible story format, um, which is something that um, all of you on the corp comm side, side really love. Um, so let's say that we have a CEO come in. Um, we had like Jamie Dimon come in maybe a year ago. Um, if you are Jamie Dimon and you give an interview to a wire, maybe they'll write like a story, like 600 words, they'll call it like a wide ranging interview and they'll just touch on like every single point that you know, all the major, you know, four or five points that he made and that's sort of it. Um, and then with us, like he came in, we did three videos, non-paywall, you know, stories in front of the paywall, stories behind the paywall, a full transcript. Um, so we try to be pretty flexible with, um, with all of that when it comes to, to multimedia formats. And again, I think that's a way to, to stand out. Um, and then just quickly, like going back to my first point um, with regard to the importance of personalization, um, something that we are starting to do, but others have done much better, <laughs> like the Times um, and the FT and others is um, hiring really amazing data scientists um, and figuring out how your audience is engaging with your site, what articles brought you to them to the site, how they're spending their time, is your politics coverage, is your coronavirus coverage, is your retail coverage, um, and then making sure that you're, you know, that your audience are seeing these stories and that they're top of mind, um, you know, control, there's a lot of talk about, we'll get into newsletters and sub stacks, but the idea of controlling your distribution methods, um, and so you're not relying on, on, um, on the platforms for that. Um, so I'd say those are, those are the main ways in which I think, um, me, you know, media models are able to stand out now in a sea of content. Yeah, it's, um, it's so crowded. Thank you. Um, just the idea of competing with Netflix is just a terrifying thought. Um, Francesco, um, just picking up on what Olivia said in the, uh, the given the importance and the power of personalization, um, I'm really interested from your perspective, the nuances of computational journalism as a driving force. And if you can tell us a little bit about yourself and then talk about that and um, include the, the way um, that we talked about removing bias from AI in computational journalism, really interested in this topic um, and if you could say hi and 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 also talk about the human touch that you bring in the work that you're doing now. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Francesco. Um, I'm a computational journalist. So essentially what that means is that um, I'm combining data science with, with an editorial lens. Um, 
So holding data to a higher standard with the goal of finding um, what I call ground truth. Um, so I recently um, left the Wall Street Journal where I was the R&D chief in the newsroom to start a company called Applied Excel, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a second. Uh, in prior to the Wall Street Journal, I was also at, uh, at the Newswire, at the Associated Press, um, where I was the co-lead for um, AI and automation uh, in the newsroom. Um, and so the, what I've been focusing for the, the last um, uh, several years has been to uh, bring uh, technology to the process of, of news gathering, production and, and distribution. Uh, specifically, um, really focusing on uh, the power of, of machine learning, natural language processing, and other um, uh, artificial intelligence uh, techniques. In the goal, um, in usually the reaction when when we talk about these um, these uh, technologies in the context of news, uh, the reaction is whether you know is this as a journalist is this going to take uh, my job? Are robots going to replace humans in the newsroom? And the answer is no. Uh, the goal of um, putting in place these practices where you know, we can take uh, data from, you know, economic results or financial results in, um, in, in, in many other data sets and then turn them automatically into narratives that sound like humans. The goal there is to really um, augment rather than um, replace uh, human work. So I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, there's, uh, journalists spend, uh, spend uh, uh, hours and hours doing uh, t types of stories that are very formulaic, if you, if you will. So think about financial earnings reports, sports recaps. And so if you take that type of more time consuming work away from, from journalists, then you can free them up so they can uh, focus on uh, higher impact uh, storytelling and, and do all sorts of things that Olivia was describing in terms of understanding the audience, um, uh, looking at uh, ways of, of generating uh, personalized experiences and, and so on. So um, what I'm doing right now with, with Applied Excel is building a, a new type of information company where we are automating um, every step of, of the automation of the news uh, and information gathering process. So from um, sourcing the data uh, to packaging it in, into alerts or reports and then distributing it through uh, different interfaces. And so although, although we, we are talking about you know, automation and, and machine learning, there's very much uh, a human component. Um, as, as probably uh, everyone is aware, um, AI is developed by humans and those humans have, um, uh, make mistakes. And so the biases uh, that humans have, either uh, you know, different types of, of, of biases are reflected uh, in, these, um, in these algorithms. And so the only way to really assess the validity and in, 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 in define ground truth and in, in create transparent uh, algorithmic results is to audit them. Uh, and in fact, it's you know, to ask the same questions to the algorithms that we would ask from, from a human source. So um, you know, if, you, if you're interviewing uh, Jamie Diamond to use the Olivia's example, uh, you would ask about you know the financial results of of the bank and you know different strategies. It's the same thing with an algorithm, where we can ask uh, quote unquote questions on why uh, they made certain uh, decisions. And so that calibration uh, happens through uh, expert um, uh, experts in different domains. So the domains that we are looking into uh, are public health, local infrastructure, and climate change. And so we have experts engaging with the algorithmic results. So uh, think about, you know, alerts um, on different topics related to, you know, outbreaks in, in diseases, um, new projects in local infrastructure, um, issues related to um, uh, uh, climate uh, related events. And then we have experts looking at the results and say, well, this is valid, this is not valid. 
here is an outlier that we should look into more. And so this is the this is what we call the human in the loop, where um, where the the where the algorithm can uh, produce higher quality information. And then broadly speaking, at the at higher level, the goal is to provide um, very specific uh, in, uh, industries across uh, sectors uh, very specific insights uh, for their decision making. So. Um, replicating uh, or creating micro news wires for you know energy for the energy industry, healthcare, construction, and mining uh, you know data sets and information from from all different types of, of sources. That's um, that is so fascinating, and I know we're going to talk in a little bit about some of the digital disruptors and the new media models. But the idea of that hyper focus in a world where we're now seeing hyper specificity in some of these subject matter um, is really interesting. I'm curious, Olivia, just from a data and analytics and computation um, perspective, um, do you have any thoughts on um, how data is driving? Um, the subscription models and um, also that importance of the human touch as we um, are able to use more and more data and analytics to drive our decision making? Yeah, so um, again, we are just in the early state, we at Insider and BI are just in the early stages of building our subscription business. We're only about two years in. So we just hired um, our, you know, a, some data scientists, a team not too long ago, maybe six, nine months ago. Um, and I honestly, I've said this to them, I feel like we were flying blind before um, without them because the insights that they're able to survive and they're able to provide us, um, it's really invaluable. And they really, what we really stress is um, actionable insights. So we'll say like, can you look into X, Y, Z and like, tell us what we should do. Um, like, you know, can you uh, work with us to, um, we're going to, you know, we're going to run a test around pricing models and, um, you know, AB test. And um, can you help us evaluate, like, you know, what model we should, we should run with. Um, and it's been amazing. Um, I guess the, the one thing that I would say is that um, you do need, um, you, you can't just rely on data um, because data is not going to give you, tell you everything. It's not going to tell you the full picture. Um, and, and I mean, with us, um, because our, the, the, I guess the move to the subscription model has been, um, it's been really, you know, it's been disruptive, I think, in the newsroom. Um, we have some reporters that are folk that have traffic goals. Um, so they're incentivized by, um, you know, by page views. And then we have other reporters um, that are focused on, um, you know, on, on driving subscriptions. And if you think about those two incentives intrinsically, it's gonna different type, it's gonna drive different types of behavior. Um, generally, when you're, you know, when you're focused on traffic, um, you're looking at eyeballs, you're looking at clicks, it's going to drive a certain type of story. Not to say it's not a good story, but it's going to be different um, versus, you know, subscriptions, which allows you to go a bit deeper um, into, you know, perhaps areas that are a little bit nichier, um, you know, areas where you, you're not going to get a million page views, but maybe, you know, the revenue that you're um, accumulating from a smaller group of people is, you know, exceeds that. Um, so I think with those, you know, with those two things in mind, um, when you're taught, when you're changing things, when you're, you know, moving around business models, um, again, you can't just rely on data. You really have to, it really turns into sort of like a psychological experiment, um, where, um, especially in my role, I'm, you know, I'm telling the news and we're making these change, you know, we talk to the data team, you know, and the revenue team, we're making these changes. Um, but like, here's why we're doing it. Here's what you need to know. Here's why it's going to affect you. Um, so I think like that, you know, if these are people's jobs and their lives and they're not, they're confused why, you know, everyone could see their stories before and now people can't see them. And what does that mean for their ability to, something that I hear a lot is for, um, you know, I, I, you know, I got pitched um, this awesome exclusive from a CEO, um, but they don't want it behind the paywall. And I, you know, they want everyone to see it. Um, can you explain to me why it's still valuable for them to work with us? And that's a question that um, I hear a lot. Um, and we sort of have to get into them. Well, you know, maybe they'll get more eyeballs before, but the audience is not as good. It's a much more, you know, behind the paywall. It's a wealthier audience. It's a more professional audience. It's the audience that you want. Um, so again, like just going back to the need for, you know, human touch, regardless of, um, you know, the great insights you're getting from the data side. So, um, I want to pick up on a couple of things you said, but, but, um, with regard to, you know, getting that better audience is, is the, 
the best, richest, longest form content always behind the paywall for you? Is it um, is that sort of the the promised land? Is to get to the most authentic, deepest content? But do I would say that, I would say often yes, um, but not a hundred percent of the time. So, for example, um, we will test content outside the paywall. We'll see what the traffic is like. Um, generally, I mean, where 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 it's been challenging is um, a few things. So. Um, the coronav coronavirus coverage has been really challenging for us and other publishers. And they've really had to think about, um, should we make everything free? Um, because it's in, you know, it's in the, is, is that in the best interest? Um, or we're a business and, um, you know, we're not a, we're not a nonprofit. Um, and, you know, we are, you know, going to put that content behind the paywall. So we've done a mix of both and sort of settled on like health related, anything related to health related content, safety, outside the paywall, anything related to, um, you know, drug mayors making money on vaccines, um, you know, more business oriented content behind the paywall. Um, we've had to think about it a lot with a lot of our Me Too coverage, um, coverage around sexual harassment and misconduct and, um, and you know, some of the, the DNI stuff we've done around Black Lives Matters. Um, is that behind the paywalls, in front of the paywall? We've run into situations where we had um, our most successful story, you know, paywall story ever, um, I won't give numbers, but um, it, you know, it was it blew up, and it was um, about um, allegations of uh, at, at Bon Appetit magazine um, that some of the the black talent um, had been had been you know treated badly and, and undermined, um, and this, you know the story exploded on social media, um, and the reporter um, got a lot of backlash because the story was was uh, behind the paywall um, or it was in front of the paywall, and then we moved it. Um, and, you know, a lot of her sources were upset. They said, I trusted you. I wanted this to reach the, you know, the broadest audience as possible. I feel like you, you know, you betrayed me. Um, and, you know, the reporter was upset. Um, so um, I think it is a really difficult balance for publishers to figure out, you know, what works best for them, what's worked best for their audience, and then still trying to keep up morale, especially now in the newsroom, um, you know, when you're hearing things like that from, from sources. Yeah, that it, it brings me to my next question, which um, which was originally for Cameron, and I think um, Olivia, you've just hit on it, which is the idea of risk, um, risk when we're trying um, to understand the speed to truth and authentic content, risk with regard to these platformers opting in and opting out of so many different sources, and if you've got a if you've got a consumer that has a bad experience with a product, how do you contain that risk, which might be actually a small issue, but it could, in our environment today, it could become a global problem for a brand. But also what you're just saying, Olivia, is that there's a risk from the side of sources, risk from the side of, I'm assuming that you're operating in a very day-to-day um, you know, um, reaction of understanding the world around us and some of the external factors that we can't really control and determining what where content sits with regard to the payroll, but also does that bring risk in terms of a source or a story or um, you know a relationship? Um, but Cameron, can you talk a little bit about? I mean, you know, corp communications, risk management, um, public policy in this fast-moving world, um, and like I said, knowing that you know how many people have a product of yours um, or more than one product in their household, how do you manage risk? And does your the global scale of Samsung, does that hurt or help you? Or it, does it matter in this, you know, platformer world with, with so much available and the speed that a story can travel, um, you know, before you wake up in the morning, for example, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, and then um, I don't know if Olivia, if there's anything else you want to say about about the risk in the day to day and how you manage that business, and and Francesco, how how computational journalism and data can help in the managing and predicting uh, predictive analytics and risk. But I'll start with I'll start with Cameron. Yeah, uh, Emily, I would say it depends on the day. I mean, I think in the in the, in the notion of risk landscape you know, wins here, uh, what, what's the landscape look like? And the reality is that when Samsung's in the headlines, it's gonna drive the clicks, you know, that Olivia was talking about. And and our our job here, from our perspective, is to understand, is that a story that we wanna be a part of? 
is that a story that we have an opinion or point of view on? You know, are we represented in the right way? And, and we're doing that not just in the U.S., but globally. So the way we're organized is we have a global media team based in Seoul, and we have news desks around the world. And so when they're asleep, we're awake. When we're asleep, they're awake, and we're, we're basically handing off the baton. And so our radar, because of, of, of what the, the great work that Francesco and Olivia are doing, it's forcing our radar to get better, more sophisticated, and augment our, our reputation stewards who are working in this landscape uh, to be able to navigate that and really understand um, how we can be helpful uh, to a journalist in telling the story. And you know, we, there are some things that we do that are still very old school because we feel like relationships matter. You know, we we talk monthly as a team, as a corporate affairs teams, on you know where we have the relationship with the journalist or an editor. You know, all the way up to the top and who's got that relationship because. We have much a much bigger story to tell here than just innovation. You know, we have sustainability, citizenship, economic impact. You know, a number a number of contributions that the corporation makes. And so, to be able to do all that, you have to have a fine tuned radar. But then you have to have a really collaborative team who appreciates what each uh, person brings to the table, can really take the great technology and insights that uh, that come from these tools, interpret them help us understand where there's an opportunity and where there's a, a, a risk. And so, you know, I would, I would say that that is, that's probably our, our secret sauce is that we're extremely collaborative and we recognize and realize that the corporation is much bigger than any one individual. And it's our job here to make sure that we're successful in making sure that that story is, is, is representative and, and fully complete. Has the, um, has the pandemic played a role in, how you evaluate risk and 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 what you want to engage in uh, versus what you don't um, in this in this time. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, you know, if you think about the the way that coronavirus spread around the world, you know, it hit Korea earlier, so we were dealing with this earlier. In fact, one of our flagship launches in February, we do this, you know, twice a year in person. At our flagship launch in February in San Francisco, you know, we had to. Uh, bring out, you know, medical support, you know, to ensure the safety of our attending press. And, and you know, we treated it as, a, a, as an event in a current coronavirus environment. So that was a wake up call for us, um, not just how we do events, but then also internally, how we ensure the safety and security of our workforce, and obviously how that translates into our retail environments as well. So, you know, we've been thinking about this for, for quite a while. Um, I would say that Overall, technology has a role to play in you know, the pandemic. I think we're still finding uh, and realizing what that is through conversations with our consumers. Obviously, they very much care about the practicality of the current environment. You know, how am I schooling? How am I shopping? How am I uh, working digitally and remotely? And so technology is more of an enabling factor, but we may not be you know, sanitizing your home like you know, the Cloroxes and the, the PNGs of the world. So you kind of look at that and you, you say, what role does technology play and how can we help? And so we're continuing to fine tune that narrative. We, we made it a, a core component of our newsroom uh, early on. And then we figured, all right, this is going to be a, a, a piece of content that, that our stakeholders really care about, but how do we infuse it in our in our day-to-day -day narrative? And you'll see like, we've evolved that. At first it was our response to COVID and now it's very much a kind of way that we're operating and doing business. Great, thanks. Um, Olivia, do you have any more thoughts about how how the pandemic has impacted um, risk on your side? Um, and and I think you, you spoke a little bit about, you know, what, what goes in front of the payroll with regard to our external environment. I'm not sure if you have anything else to add. And then I'm, um, I'm interested in Francesco from a data perspective. Um, how are you advising from a predictive analytics perspective on risk in some of these external environments? I don't know if this is so much risk, um, but it sort of shows the power of having to be, to keep your platform flexible. Um, so we noticed, I guess it was probably around in mid-March, it was right when the stay-at-home orders had started, um, that our subscriptions um, and traffic um, nosedived. Um, and we thought that it was some, we thought there was an algo change. Um, you, we thought maybe there was something, we thought there was a problem on our side. We couldn't really figure out what went wrong. Um, so again, we went back to our, to our data science team and we said, can you tell us what um, you know, what stories are, you know, people are engaging with and, you know, sort of, is there anything predictive that you can tell us about, like, 
you know, why this is happening. Um, they came back to us and said, no one's interested in, in your core business coverage right now. No one's reading it. Um, people are interested in the economy. They're scared about their jobs and they want to read about the vaccines and, their, and they want to know what's going on with their health. So you should probably, you know, our advice is to change what you're writing about. <laughs> so we did. Um, and we sort of listened to what our readers were telling us. Um, and um, not that we, you know, what, you know, completely abandoned um, our core area of coverage, but we moved into more what our readers were caring about now, um, which was a lot of, you know, very forward looking. Um, what is this going to mean for my job in the future? What is this going to mean about future of work? Um, how is this going to, you know, disrupt the world? Um, and so, you know, for the next several months, um, we saw our numbers, like many other publishers, um, we had the coronavirus, the corona bump, because people were super interested in news, just what they were interested in had, you know, their coverage, their you know, topics that they were interested in had shifted. Um, so I think, I think that's sort of how I would identify um, how we responded to, you know, to that event. Yeah, I mean, it, it was certainly a, um, like all of the measurement models changed, uh, you know, like all of a sudden what you were looking at in terms of engagement, in terms of placements from an agency side, you know, we had to 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 pivot um, and, and make sure that, um, you know, we were also doing everything that we could from an agency side to counsel our clients and what to do and what to say and what not to do and all of that. Um, um, Francesco, from, from the computational side, can you talk about how you and your tools and your point of view helps um, uh, with managing risk in this environment that we're we're in today. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so as I mentioned, we are using computational journalism as a business intelligence tool. And since we are on Zoom, if I can maybe share for one second, oh, I can't. Uh, but I can maybe um, after the after this panel share some some links. I wanted to show some some examples. Um, but essentially we are um, looking at different ways of, of, of quantifying risk. Um, one of the recent uh, uh, tools that we launched that is being used both by uh, journalists as well as, um, you know, uh, public officials in, in healthcare administrators is a preparedness score uh, at the county level where we are able to see the impact uh, on, on infrastructure on the healthcare infrastructure in terms of, you know, hospital bed availability and um, in the, the risk that each county faces, uh, you know, in the context of, of the pandemic. Um, and that's the, the, these tools that we are building are all dynamic and validated by, uh, by experts. And so if um, I was just trying to see if I could share again, but it seems like it's disabled. Um, give me one second. Um, and so we are applying this, this approach where we are combining uh, different uh, data sets. So for this preparedness score that I, that I was mentioning, uh, we collected data for 3,007 counties. So anything from the number of hospital beds available to the critical staff, uh, to you know, the demographics, the so socioeconomic status, and um, obviously uh, COVID-19 dynamic models. And so what we are able to do is combine all of these data points into one, um, one simplified score that is uh, you know, from very high preparedness to very low preparedness. And now we are applying this approach to uh, evaluate all sorts of, of, of risk in terms of risk on retail, on um, you know, education and going back to school. Um, on, on the local resilience in, in economy, uh, as well as applying these same techniques for computational journalism to track some of the things that, uh, you know, that we care most about, specifically, uh, you know, cures for, for COVID uh, and looking at all the, the, um, the clinical trials that uh, there are being studied. So the reality is that there's a wealth of data out there. Uh, mostly uh, public data in the US does a really good job at um, you know, documenting uh, and making available these data sets in terms of uh, policy or demographics or physical capacity. So the problem is not accessing the data. The problem is validating it and then making sense of it. Um, and so 
uh, our approach has been to uh, try to establish ground truth uh, as well as um, looking at risks and in, in, in vulnerabilities for all of these different um, external forces that are impacting us from you know, uh, public health concerns uh, to the local infrastructure as well as, as climate. Uh, and these tools can be used not only for, uh, you know, journalistic purposes, you know, the same way that a financial reporter goes to a Bloomberg terminal to check the, you know, the, the, the stock market, other professionals should be able to do that for their own industries, either be pharma or education or energy. And so uh, it, it's really about uh, establishing this base level of understanding of, of the, the external forces that are influencing different industries. Yep, yep, for sure. I, um, I always remember when I was told and when I was learning first about data, um, if, you're in a, if, if you've got all this data and you're in a room and you're talking about data, you're making a mistake. You have to talk about what the data means, how you use the data. Um, so I really appreciate that answer. I want to shift now to something that I find um, I find really interesting, and I actually find that we don't talk a lot about. Um, and in particular, because Francesco and Olivia, you are former journalists. I'm so interested about your thoughts on the role of a journalist today. In some of our conversations in preparing for this, um, you know, we talked about the expectation that a journalist is like a walking and talking human, like media entity. Um, Francesco, I'd love for you to start because you also said something that really sparked with me, which was the idea that a journalist is operating as like a chief information officer. And then I'd like to move to Olivia. And you said something that um, really sparked as well, which was about how, um, how we're building flexible um, uh, stories for them in our newsrooms and how we're flexing into the new role of journalists um, as as agencies and as 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 content providers. So, Francesco, I'll start with you with this idea of journalists as the new information officers. Um, yeah. So I, I I mentioned that in the context of um, being able to manage flows of information, of data, of insights and sources. And so increasingly you see modern newsrooms uh, using and, uh, and implementing all sorts of, of, of tools, either be analytics or personalization or audience engagement um, mechanisms. And so not only it's important to, you know, to tell great stories and, and, and to look for, um, you know, for uh, engaging narratives, but it's also crucial to know how uh, to optimize the, 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 the processes. So the vision that I have of, of journalism for the future is almost like the, the traffic controller at the airport who is looking at the most efficient way to, um, to make sense of all the, you know, all the flight patterns, in this case, the information patterns in how to prioritize um, you know what's what's shown in in uh, how to validate um, data and in in trustworthy information. So, in in the modern landscape, um, and uh, in the context where journalists are information officers, the most important currency is trust. I mean, this has been true for for a long time, but. I think now we are we are living sort of an information apocalypse, and trust is the only antidote antidote for for that um, for this situation. So, issues related to uh, you know journalistic transparency, algorithmic transparency on how why you're uh, why you're seeing a certain type of content or why you're being surface a, a specific data point are uh, fundamental, and those are things that are being managed by, by the modern journalist. Yeah, I think that's, um, I think that's so insightful. Um, and I think it's really actionable for those of us um, on the agency side of the business as well. And Olivia, um, I thought when, when we spoke, um, the way you talked about um, 
preparedness for flexible stories. And also this idea that there are journalists that are like um, covering these hyper-specific um, topics that are sort of like gurus in their own industry. And I just thought you could talk a little bit about that from your experience um, as a journalist and, and what you're seeing in terms of the shift from um, when you were on the ground doing it uh, to what you're seeing the expectation is today. Yeah, so I definitely think it's it's pretty amazing that um, the role of journalists has evolved such that they're their own brands, um, and in some cases, even bigger than the news organizations that they work with. If you look at like a Jonathan Swan or um, Kara Swisher when she was at Recode, and, and you know, there's there's many other examples. Um, you, you know, journalists can <clears throat> grow their follower base to you know hundreds of thousands of followers, millions of followers, um, a really dedicated base, um, and they can also. I talked a bit about you know distribution earlier. Um, but they can really use their own social platforms as distribution methods for their stories. Um, you know, if you have millions of Twitter followers, um, that's perhaps, you know, an even more powerful mechanism for getting out your stories to the right audience um, that it might be relying on your own, you know, media organizations um, way of, you know, the way that they're promoting their stories, which gets, you know, suppressed, um, you know, across the, the different platforms. Um, and you know, you've seen people, whether it's Bill Simmons, Nate Silver, really build their own media empires um, with their hyper-focused follower bases. So um, it's pretty amazing. Um, and what I also find really interesting is someone might like hate your media brand, like maybe they absolutely hate the New York Times, um, but they really trust you, um, and so they're you know they're willing to to read what you write and um, and to follow you. Um, and I think that that's because you know you're an expert in X Y Z area. Um, and I think that loyalty, um, you know, has really shielded a lot of journalists from broader mistrust um, of the media. And I mean, Emily, I know you. There was a specific example that I um, had mentioned in our in our pre-call, um, which was around um, again, like the idea of um, even like really like niche journalists um, become you know being superstars in in their area. And the example that I gave was. Um, I, um, I used to work with a guy at, at Reuters who covered market structure, which is like covering, you know, stock exchanges and high frequency trading. And it's like very, very niche, but, um, you know, maybe there's a, you know, 10,000 people, you know, maybe less than that who care about it. Um, but they really, really care. And it's super wonky and weird. And there's not that many, there's like a few trade publications, but there's not that many journalists that really cover it that in depth. Um, and this guy's been covering it for a really long time, maybe like 10 years. Um, and I went to a conference once that was like, you know, focused on this, um, on this topic and, um, you know, had my badge and I was at Reuters at the time and people came up to me like senior executives and they said, oh my God, do you know, you know, this guy, John, you work with John, like he is, he, do you like, I, I he was like a hero to them. Like it was, it was just incredible. Um, and you know, he's just like. You know, guy behind a desk, and you know, and they're they're the ones that are actually actually you know like executing the you know they're you know more important in in, the, in you know in the industry, but um but in their eyes he's like such a stud. Um, so I, I just found that really um really remarkable, and that's just on a small scale. Um, if you think about that, you know, the journalists now, particularly like in politics and tech, um, that have really become superstars. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the this desire to know like the face behind the story. Um, um, is, is kind of, um, I think the shift, uh, that we're seeing here and that kind of leads us into the next question, which is in this media renaissance, um, and with all of the new tools for writers to connect directly with their readers, um, and this idea that the, you know, the inbox has become way more exciting than the newsfeed because you can fill it with just the journalists um, and the influencers and the voices that you want to hear. And I'm interested also, Cameron, how do you, um, you know, from, from the agency perspective, a lot of times we get um, from a client, you know, these are, these are the media outlets that we want it, we want coverage in. Like, here's the top 50, here's the top 10, you know, um, we're not really necessarily interested in the digital disruptors. But in some cases, what we're seeing is that they are actually driving what top tier coverage, coverage. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, um, from the whole panel, Cameron first, and then um, I think Olivia too, because I think this applies to, to, to some of the things we just talked about. But how do you approach this renaissance of these digital disruptors um, 
And how are you bringing them into uh, your larger story? Again, especially at the scale of a Samsung, um, do you find that they're driving uh, stories? Do you find that engaging with them is helping or hurting you? Um, how do you view this, you know, the newsletters, the, the type houses and the, um, you know, all of these, these new media models? Because the tools are essentially allowing consortiums of journalists and individuals to set up their own little media companies. Um, so I'm interested, um, Cameron, first in, in, in your approach and how you feel about that, the impact that they have on, on how to stories are being told and, and that, that speed to truth that you talk about. Yeah, I mean, we, we fully embrace it. I mean, we, we have to, and especially in big tech, whenever you have you know, a very specific um, uh, group of, of reporters and influencers who have their own brands and are, are driving, um, obviously, a tremendous amount of traffic for, for us and also you know, uh, many of our competitors in our landscape, you know, this, this is the place where you, you have to remain relevant. You have to also be part of a shared journey that you know, especially technology fans are, 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 are on and they want to know the latest and greatest and why you made that decision. And so many of these influencers and, and, and journalists who cover us in this space are looking for that unique angle. And so we work with them uh, routinely to figure out what that is and, and how we can help them um, you know, I would, I would say that, you know, we, we have very, very uh, distinct moments when we know um, we want to bring them inside of a, a kind of the, the inner sanctum of Samsung. And those are our flagship moments. That's the Consumer Electronics Show in, in, in Las Vegas, obviously virtual this year. Um, it's our unpacked events. It's our, it's our flagship events, you know, around, around the world. And when we, we launch a new product. And so we, we help them understand the kind of the story and what we take them on. Um, and we get feedback from, from not just them, but also analysts to help us understand, is it resonating? And what, what are we doing? Is it resonating? Um, we, we follow them very closely to where they're moving from publication to publication. We also talk very openly as a corporate affairs team on how business models for media are changing and what they're prioritizing from an editorial standpoint. So I think it's really just kind of uh, keeping everyone on the same page in a corporate affairs department on how this landscape is shifting. And then that allows people to have a greater sense of ownership whenever they're engaging you know, with the influencer and, and also quite frankly, respect. When, when, when you're talking to your agencies or you're evaluating coverage, is the balance shifting at all for you from traditional top tier to some of these um, very respected um, influential journalists that are connecting directly to their audience? Are you seeing a bit of, um, you know, from a corporate perspective, the evaluation of, wow, coverage over here um, might in some cases be more relevant, more authentic than coverage in a more traditional outlet? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's in both. And it depends on the story you're trying to, to, to tell. Obviously, we, um, we are number one or number two in many of the product categories that we're competing. So when it's a product story, Absolutely, you want to go into the, the influencer realm and you're just going to see tremendous lift and impact. Uh, I think we benefit as a top five brand in the world from our own channels as well. So we can amplify when we really need to and get the message out. Um, and so that's a unique, um, you know, unique lever to Samsung and a, few, a handful of other brands. Um, but then we very much rely upon the traditional uh, you know, as well. And that, that may be more of the, the story, the human interest story, the story that you know, we have a, a, a long history of education in the United States where we, we sponsor one of the largest STEM competitions for students around the world to solve problems in their local communities using STEM skills. And so very much going to traditional media, helping them understand the impact that we're having in education and communities where we live and work. That is very, very much up the, um, the alley of, of working with a traditional media outlet and helping them understand the full story of Samsung beyond the product and the innovation. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wish we could go on forever. We only have five minutes left. Um, so I'm just going to cut that question short and I'm just going to ask the panel. Um, given this, given this, uh, the platformers, the choose your own adventure and the, and the media renaissance we're living in, um, if each of you could just leave us today with a thought on either um, the idea of resilience um, in the media um, what your agencies can do better or what we're seeing um, 
really work from a partnership perspective across the board. Um, so Cameron, I'll start with you um, and then Olivia and then we'll end with Francesco. Um, and uh, please be quick because I know the next panel starting in a few minutes. Um, and if we get cut off, uh, but Cameron, why don't you go ahead? Sort of what's the, what's the number one takeaway from you? The thing that's really um, um, making you excited about your role? Yeah, first I would say continue to enhance your radar. I mean, obviously uh, Olivia and, and Francesco are uh, working with publications that are really reshaping our landscape. And so understanding that, making sure that you have the right radar in place to look at the opportunities and also look at the risk is super important, but also hire great people. I mean, this is what I would just challenge any of our agency partners. And also when we have people uh, joining our company, you know, hire really great people who are collaborative and, and realize this is this is bigger than them. And you know, I will shamelessly plug, we are hiring right now. So please, if you're interested in joining our team, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. And then finally, be open to change. You know, I, I studied journalism 20 years ago and I worked in the era of Fax Blast and you know, this has changed drastically now. Um, and so you have to be open to change and understanding like this, this, this world is going to evolve minute by minute and be, be open to that, be ready to that, look at the opportunities that it presents for you. Thanks, Olivia. Olivia, are you still with us? How about you, Francesco? Yeah, I'm here. Um, you know, I, I would just share share a thought as it relates to uh, partnerships and um, uh, organizations and companies working with, with newsrooms. Um, one thought I'll leave is that uh, I think the future of press releases are actually data releases. And um, if, you're, if you have access to data that tell the story of something that you're working on or a new product that that you are focusing on. Um, I think there's huge demand by newsrooms to, uh, to get that type of data uh, and to focus on, um, on data storytelling rather than just a, a traditional um, you know, uh, coverage of, of an activity of a company. Yeah, um, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. When you, when we talked about that, I thought that that was a, a light bulb moment as well. Um, Olivia, are you still with us? Do you want to have a, a final yeah. a final thought? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, no, I would just say, um, I would just say the number one thing I've, I guess I've learned from operating this environment is just be flexible and, um, in, and use data, you know, as I, as I said before, um, really try to understand your readers um, understand, you know, or your, your audience just generally um, understand, you know, what they might want and deliver it to them as opposed to just creating content and hoping that, you know, that will match what your, what your audience you know, is looking for. That's great. That's great. Thank you guys so much. This was um, really exciting. I hope everyone has a, a wonderful day. It goes back to all of the platforms and all the ways that they're consuming content. Um, and as you do, we think about this world that we're living in and, and this renaissance. So um, I thank you all for your time, uh, your thoughts, um, and um, I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Fleischman Hillard. Thank you, panelists. Um, that was a, a bracing start to the day. I, I, I have to say that um, you know, I remember 10, 10 or 12 years ago, all of the conversations that I was having um, were about how media relations had become almost a commodity product in public relations. Um, and um, I remember being at a meeting at which it was suggested, it might have been by me, um, that, that big PR agencies should think about outsourcing basic media relations so that they could focus on the strategic stuff. Um, and it's clear to me now, um, as I suspect it is to all of us, that with the media environment changing, complexifying, transforming itself at such an impressive rate, uh, media relations has become a very strategic discipline once again. Uh, it's great to be reminded of that fact. Mm -hmm.